Thank you for joining us. We're gonna start in 60 seconds. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna start in about 45 seconds. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us. We're gonna start in 30 seconds and give folks time to sign on. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna start in about 15 seconds. We're just giving a few more seconds for the last folks to sign on. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Russa, Dean of the Libraries at Pepperdine. And on behalf of the Pepperdine Libraries, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture by Dr. Paul Contino, Professor of Great Books at Pepperdine. Following Paul's remarks, there will be a Q&A session. So please post your questions in the chat box and we will do our very best to address them all. Be sure to stay to the end of the Q&A because we will be sharing a link for you to sign up for, to get a chance to win one of our two autographed copies of Paul's new book that we will be giving out. Now, I first became aware of Dr. Contino's prowess as a scholar of considerable seriousness when he served as a kind of cultural attache for new Pepperdine faculty as we toured the upper and lower churches located at the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi and other important sites throughout Tuscany. Paul's razor sharp insight into the history, art, architecture, literature, and the customs of earlier civilizations uh. definitely caught my attention. His particular love of the written and printed word manifest in his lifelong work as a scholar and his long association with books and teaching students through close reading and discussion is, in this day of short attention spans and screen-based pedagogy, both commendable and humbling. Knowing that Paul is teaching a great books class just steps away from my office in Payson is somehow tremendously reassuring. It brings great comfort to know that under Paul's watchful gaze, students are being exposed to the timeless art of deep reading, critical thinking, and discourse, skills that will serve them well throughout their lives. Paul's dedication to the pedagogy and enduring value of codex-based learning brings to mind how this work invites and encourages exploration, discovery, personal reflection, and perhaps most of all, a deep and abiding respect for our intellectual ancestors whose books live on our shelves. This image brings to mind Borges' observation on the seduction of libraries and books. He writes, quote, we walk the corridors, searching the shelves and rearranging them, looking for lines of meaning amid leagues of cacophony and incoherence reading the history of the past and our future, collecting our thoughts and collecting the thoughts of others, and every so often glimpsing mirrors in which we may recognize creatures of the information. Now, over the years, I've also come to deeply, deeply appreciate Paul's passion for music of all genres. I've relished the fleeting moments when we have exchanged notes on our current listening favorites, Bruce Springsteen, John Coltrane, J.S. Bach, the list goes on. If what emerges from these humble observations is a kind of Renaissance man, that would be overly simplistic. At, the, at his heart, Paul is a brilliant mentor and a teacher who has been awarded the Howard A. White Award for Teaching Excellence, not once, but twice. 
and whose students are quick to sing his praises, many of whom I suspect when asked which class they remember most from their years at Seaver, will be quick to call out as top on their list of Pepperdine moments, the reflective and often probing time spent with Paul and fellow students gathered around a massive marble table together seeking to bring alive selections from the great book canon. Prior to joining the Pepperdine family, Paul taught for 12 years at Christ College, the Honors College of Valparaiso University. He has co-edited the journal Christianity and Literature and co-edited the book Bactine and Religion, A Feeling for Faith, published in 2001. He has published essays on classic authors such as Dante and Jane Austen, as well as on contemporary writers such as Tobias Wolfe, Andre Dubus, and Alice McDermott, as well as the English poet Sir Geoffrey Hill. His most recent book and the topic of today's lecture is entitled Dostoevsky's International, excuse me, Incarnational Realism, Finding Christ Among the Karamazovs. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming friend and colleague, Dr. Paul Contino to the podium. I am getting a thumbs up from uh, Jeff Bowen. Mark, I um, didn't hear a word you said. I have no idea why at this time of over a year with Zoom, my speakers decide today to die on me. Especially ironic since you and I both love music. I feel like I'm in a space capsule talking aloud, but have no way of hearing mission control. But the show must go on. The show will go on. I'm sure whatever you said was kind and generous. I thank you. Oh, Mark, would you do me one favor? Could you turn your screen on so I don't feel completely alone? Uh, thank you. Um, right now, you're the only face I can see. If you could just keep that on, even if I put you to sleep, which I may very well do for all participants. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank Jeff for making this possible. Occasionally, I'm going to look at you, Mark. I'm going to say, can you hear me? I guess you can. Yes, good. I also want to thank any librarians tuned in. Um, they're the ones who, when I needed a book or needed a article, they were always there, very helpful to get those resources for me. I want to thank Lee Katz. I think he's tuned in. He was enormously supportive of my research and writing all along the way. And I want to thank the students that have zoomed in. And I'm very eager to hear your questions when I stop talking. And I will. And uh, this may be a first for you on Zoom. I'm going to pick up the telephone because Jeff will call me at my office number. And in that way, I can hear him read your questions in the order that he'll wish me to respond to them. I think I'll be able to see the chat too. You can type them in. But anyway, I wish I could hear you. I wish I could see you. Uh, we have to beware of Zoom bombers and uh, faulty speakers. Um, so this morning I started writing out a presentation and I wrote a few pages and I reread it this afternoon and I realized that um, in fact, what I wrote in the book was a lot more clear and a lot more concise. I was trying to rewrite the book and it was coming out in as sentences usually are when you write them for the first time, uh, rather poor prose. So. I turned to the book and I found some passages that I think would make for a better presentation. I don't wanna speak for more than a half an hour. Um, and uh, on Zoom, especially ironically without speakers today, I much prefer to be in conversation. Um, I, I love dialogue and I'm looking forward to at least getting your questions via telephone or chat room as we begin. Uh, so I'm going to be reading some portions of my book that I hope will give you an overview. Um, it's going to be a claim on your attention, uh, but if you bear with me and give me a half hour, I'd be very, very grateful. Um, I wish I could see you. I wish I could hear you, but here we go. Um, the book is a long time in the making. I've been talking about teaching Brothers Karamazov for a long time. I'm right now teaching uh, three great books classes and um, 
they're wonderful students. And uh, I hope this is especially helpful to you uh, as you're writing your long papers. I'll begin at the beginning of my book, um, although I will point out that in the acknowledgments page, I write the following. I've sometimes said that my vocation is simply to get people to read the Brothers Karamazov. If my book gets more people to read that book, then I'll consider it a success. So that's my goal. If you want to buy my book, great. Um, but uh, I'd rather you read the Brothers Karamazov, for which my book serves as a kind of guide, a reader's guide. I hope it does. This is from the preface. It's called The Brothers Karamazov, A Transformational Classic. Near the end of his life, Fyodor Nikolovich Dostoevsky was completing the Brothers Karamazov, and he was invited to go to Moscow to give a speech in honor of the poet Pushkin. Most people there had been reading the novel as it was published in serial form, and Dostoevsky wrote a letter to his wife, Anna, describing the way they greeted him. Crowds of men and women came backstage to shake my hand. As I walked across the hall during intermission, a host of people, youths and graybeards, ladies, rushed toward me exclaiming, you're our prophet. We've become better people since we read the Karamazovs. The author was delighted. He would hoped his novel, which would be his last, would have such a positive impact on his readers. But can a work of literature really make a better person? Early in the novel, the eldest brother, Dimitri, declares his doubt. He's read all the great poets, especially the romantic ones, Schiller, Goethe. He quotes them by heart, but he confesses to his brother Alyosha, has it ever reformed me? Never. A literary classic may move the reader by its aesthetic beauty, its integrity of form, its radiant representation of goodness, but Assuming the reader even aspires to be better, to be good, can it move her or him further toward that goal, towards the reformation or transformations um, to which Mitya yearns? Mitya is short for Dimitri, and he's the ne'er-do-well eldest brother, drinking, womanizing, uh, thinking about murdering his father. It's a very dysfunctional family. Now, the premise of my book is that the Brothers Karamazov has an especially powerful capacity to inspire transformation in its readers, to help them become better people. David Tracy, the theologian, notes that in a classic, uh, we find something valuable, something important, some disclosure of reality that in a moment can be called a recognition, that which surprises, provokes, challenges, shocks and eventually transforms us. Some scholars, uh, Michael Epstein is one, observes that the regnant, the reigning critical practices in literature these days uh, are marked by suspicion. Um, what are the power structures working in the text? These are questions that are always important to ask. But if it's all suspicion, perhaps we've weakened our capacity to recognize transformative potential. He writes, the humanities are no longer focusing on human reflection and self-transformation. Uh, recently, uh, a wonderful critic, Rita Felsky, has suggested that literary theory would do well to reflect on, rather than condescend to, the uses of literature in everyday life, uses we've barely begun to understand. Such reorientation, with any luck, might inspire a more capacious, a more publicly persuasive rationale for why literature and the study of literature matters. And since 2012, English majors have been going down. Those of you who are English majors, fight the good fight. Literature does matter. When I was 19, I was looking for a summer novel I'd heard of a classic called The Brothers Karamazov. I decided to read it during breaks in my summer job in Manhattan. I was working as a messenger, a foot messenger, taking the train. I had a lot of time to read, so I picked up a used copy of the novel at the Strand, great used bookstore. I don't remember many shocks of recognition. I remember being baffled by the unrelenting intensity of these characters 
impressed by the words of a wise Russian monk, but little else. I would have made better sense of it all if I'd been in a class or a reading group with peers guided by a good teacher. Six years later, I found such a class in Professor Tom Werge's graduate seminar entitled The Religious Imagination in Modern Literature. This time I felt more of the novel's deep, quote, disclosure of reality. And frankly, it's been part of my equipment for living ever since. For the past 30 years, I've been teaching the novel in great books curricula and have reread it so many times I've lost count. The novel inspires me as it has many others. I can give you testimony if you like. Um, it inspires people and readers in its truth, beauty, and its portrayal of goodness, especially goodness in the face of evil. Its hero, Alexei Fyodorovich Karamazov, and I'll call him Alyosha from here on, does not at first seem very heroic or remarkable. The narrator admits this in his preface. The youngest of the Karamazov brothers is sent from the comforting shelter of a monastery by his mentor, the elder Zasima, to practice active love as a monk in the world. He attends lovingly, prudently, to his drunken, lecherous father, his guilt-laden brothers, to their lovers, to a group of boys, and a troubled teenage girl. Active love is hard work. It requires habitual practice. It's harsh and dreadful compared to love and dreams. His brother Yvonne claims that Christ-like love for men is a miracle impossible on earth, but given Zosima's insistence that grace is ever present, the miraculous power of the Lord guides even our feeblest efforts. Receptive to that reality of grace, Alyosha emerges as a luminous image, an icon, if you will, of active love. At first glance, an eccentric, he carries within him, the narrator says, the very heart of the whole. St. Paul says that all things hold together in Christ, it's Colossians. Analogously, in the world of this novel, all things hold together in Christ-like Alyosha. Dostoevsky described his final novel as a hosanna that came out of a great furnace of doubt. The novel gives narrative form to the author's purgatorial passage. Dostoevsky knew suffering, the deaths of his mother and father when he was young, his youthful revolutionary exploits on behalf of the Serbs, his subsequent arrest, mock execution, years of Siberian prison, punishing debt, poverty, compulsive gambling, family turmoil, the death of two of his little children. If you want to see a really good film rendering of this, Prime Video has an eight-part Russian-made biographical film about Dostoevsky's life that's, that's, that's worth seeing. Um, I've only seen parts, but I, you, you get a sense of the suffering this man endured. But he somehow got through it and put it all together in this final novel. He knew, Dostoevsky knew, that faith is buffeted by human experiences of finitude and pain. And he gives full latitude to the rebellious voice of his character, Yvonne, the intellectual middle brother. But he also portrays characters who mediate Christ's love in the midst of suffering, even as he anxiously wondered whether he'd offered answer enough to Yvonne's rebellion. And you can hear this in the letters he writes to his editors. Have I offered answer enough? Um, I'm hoping one of my students, Taylor, is here and he'll ask a question. He's not sure that, that Dostoevsky did, and I'd, I'd love to hear what he might have to say. Dostoevsky knew. He couldn't force his readers to accept the Christian ideal that he was trying to present in narrative form. Throughout the novel, he respects his readers' interpretive freedom by portraying characters who resist the givenness of graced being and who express potent reasons for doing so. Mikhail Bakhtin, among the most influential commentators on Dostoevsky's work, highlights the novelist's polyphony, the many voices, the many oft clashing voices that he represents in his novels. Bakhtin described Dostoevsky's world as a church comprised of unmerged souls where sinners and righteous men come together. Dostoevsky's characters are unfinalizable. The reader can't quite peg them, can't ever reduce them to their worst actions. As artistic creator, Dostoevsky respects the freedom of his characters, his persons, 
made free in the image of their creator and always capable of change. His personalism deepened the transformative potential of his final novel. I think he did carry it off. Of course, he risked the possibility that some would find the rebellious voices more persuasive. Here's an example, James Wood, who writes for the New Yorker often. Dostoevsky's parable, he writes, of the Grand Inquisitor is for me the unanswerable attack on the cruelty of God's hiddenness. In my early 20s, it proved decisive. I do think there are many though, maybe more, who found the novel to be a source of spiritual sustenance and hope. And hope is the indispensable virtue for pilgrims, pilgrims on the way, making their way bound for beatitude. We hope. Hope rejects the Janus faced temptations of presumption and despair, both of which are forms of pride, but a pilgrim isn't immune from doubt in its depiction. But a pilgrim isn't immune from doubt. In the novel's depiction of human anguish, it raises reasons to doubt. Now, Yosha tries to bring wholeness to his dysfunctional, disfigured family, but he wonders if he or even God are failing. He says to Lise, my brothers are destroying themselves, my father too, and they're destroying others with them. It's the earthly force of the Karamazov. It's a crude, unbridled force. Does that spirit of God move? Above that force? Dostoevsky asks Alyosha's very question, is divine grace present in the midst of human violence, trauma, deformation? And if so, where can it be found? Dostoevsky suggests that grace remains ever-present, mediated, mediated by persons like Alyosha, who serve as analogies of divine love. And Alyosha really, for me, is the hero of the novel. And I in the first couple of chapters, give a kind of theological prelude to my analysis of Dimitri and Ivan, and especially Alyosha's interaction with them and with the, the boys that he befriends. But I, I want to give you a little bit of that, uh, that theological prelude uh, and, and hope that it's helpful. Um, I'm especially thinking of my students writing their papers. This is from chapter one. It's entitled The Ana Analogical Imagination it's a mouthful, and incarnational realism. The book is called Dostoevsky's Incarnational Realism, Finding Christ Among the Karamazovs. Um, I'm hoping that this will become clearer as I read this portion. Dostoevsky wrote that he sought to portray the person in the person. He called his realism higher realism. It was rooted in his Christian faith, and it saw visible finite reality as bearing in an, an analogical relationship to an invisible infinite reality. An analogical imagination, one that, that, that is grounded in a kind of faith in analogy to explain things. I see a beautiful sunrise, I see a beautiful sunset. I feel the warm embrace of a friend and I say, oh, that's like God's love. Okay, that's analogy. An analogical imagination recognizes that human persons are creatures, both like and radically unlike their creator. Created in God's image, persons are like God in their rationality, freedom, and their capacity to create and love. But God is one and persons are many. God is unchanging. Persons are mutable. God is infinite. Persons are finite. Above all, persons are dependent as their existence is contingent upon God's. God is not simply another being, but being itself. The one in whom all persons live and move and have their particular beings. Our existence as beings doesn't place us in the same ontological category as God. But the divine is not so utterly transcendent that our own rational conceptions of the good and the true and the beautiful bear no relation to God. They bear an analogical relation to God. Christian faith understands God not only as being, but as love. God is a unity of three persons bound in infinite, interrelational, self-giving love. God's love overflows to form creation in time, to 
form creation and in time enters history, enters a particular place and time in the person of Christ. In Christ, the believer sees most clearly the image of God's beauty, goodness, and truth. The infinite word takes on creaturely flesh and finitude, but Christ's descent into finitude and to death brings forth resurrection, ascension, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. As Trinity, God is both one and three differentiated persons. Christ is both God and man without separation or confusion. This is the Council of Chalcedon 451, the early church council that gave us the language to understand the incarnation. The analogical imagination is built upon these two doctrinal beams that undergird the Christian faith, Trinity and incarnation. Analogy recognizes the unity in our human plurality, for all our particularity and diversity, we are each persons in analogy to God's Trinitarian nature, created to be in integral relation to other persons. Analogy recognizes that human love is both like and, given our creaturely fallen frailty, unlike the Creator's love. And this is where I was going to begin, actually. Um, I was going to begin by talking about this book. It came out, oh, maybe almost 10 years ago. It's by Mark Knoll. Some of you will know him as a foremost evangelical historian. And um, he writes in this book, Jesus Christ and the Life of the Mind, that Christ gives the warrant for the Christian intellectual to see reality in the scholar's work in apprehending reality, whatever it is, history, biology, literature, in a kind of both and a way. And he calls this a Chalcedonian orientation. Again, the Council of Chalcedon. Such an orientation, he writes, accentuates doubleness as an intellectual disposition grounded in faith in the incarnation. The view of doubleness, a both and approach, seeks the harmonious acceptance of the dichotomy and thus discerns what I'm calling via the great monastic writer Thomas Merton, the hidden ground of the hidden wholeness of reality. Elsewhere, Merton calls God the hidden ground of love. And he speaks of the hidden wholeness that's there. For me, this both like and unlike, this both-and approach to reality is crucial. And it's crucial in understanding the novel and its complexity. And uh, I think it might get us out of a lot of the fixes that we're in right now in our own time. I'll say something about that at the end, and I'll stop in 15 minutes, believe me. A both-and approach to reality recognizes both its complexity and its wholeness. It resists the temptation to order complexity with a too tidy either or categorization. Dostoevsky's novel represents reality as both graced gift and arduous task. The world as both sacramentally charged and sinfully fallen. Paradise as both here and still to come. Persons as both open in their freedom to change and closed given the realities of time, interpersonal commitment, consequences of past action, and even genetic inheritance. Dostoevsky depicts the human desire for holiness as demanding both a willing receptivity and a willed but never willful effort of self-denial. We have a student writing about, you know, self-sacrifice, self-discipline, and I'm trying to say, you know, but it's not just about what I can do. It's even more about what I can receive as a gift. And in Dostoevsky's vision, the gift is everywhere. A both-and vision should not be understood as resulting in static indecision. Rather, it fosters a prudential, that's a word I emphasize, prudence, practical wisdom. Aristotle calls it phronesis. Um, it, it fosters a prudential appreciation of particularity that 
in time necessitates decisive action. My speakers don't work. Make a decision. The show must go on. I can only hear my own voice, but I think I'm with faith that you can hear it too. And if I put you to sleep, wake up. Okay. Taking one road precludes taking another. Thus, the novel's both and vision recognizes that either or moments are inevitable. I choose one path, you choose another. This is inevitable in human experience and requires the preparatory work of discernment. You'll choose better if you think beforehand, anticipate, and discern. Having reached a clear apprehension of the truth in a particular situation, each character in the novel must decide and act. And rather than depleting personhood by foreclosing options, decisive action, freedom, enhances it. Wholeness is found in the passage through the limited. Grace remains ever available in the place of fragmentation, but as St. Thomas Aquinas emphasized, uncreated grace builds upon created nature. Infinite freedom fosters finite creatural freedom. Freedom exercised in active love is grounded in the person's precious mystic sense of our living bond with the other world. Those are Zosimus words. So even active love takes a both and form. Um, it integrates both the human inclination, our attraction to the good and the beautiful. The Greeks called this eros, right? That word has been debased in our culture. We hear erotic very differently, but eros is that which draws us to the good and the beautiful. And agape, sacrificial, self-emptying love on behalf of others. People are called to participate in the divine self-emptying, the kenosis, a perfect self-forgetfulness in the love of their neighbor in acts of self-transcendence, not self-obliteration. Dostoevsky distinguishes the relational person from the autonomous self. As one of my colleagues and teachers at Boston University, Yuri Corrigan writes, for Dostoevsky, it's a bad thing to lose one's personality, but a good thing to lose one's self. Lose yourself to find yourself. Personality is another word. It's debased. You know, oh, he's got a great personality. You know, personality is that which makes us a person. Um, our students are reading Jacques Maritain, the pers person in the common good. And there's such a rich, deep sense of what it means to be a person, both as an individual and in community. And that's another key, both and, that um, Dostoevsky recognizes. Dostoevsky affirmed that the fullness of personhood, one's true self, emerges only through the gift of self. And in this way, Dostoevsky's vision bears a deep affinity to two other writers we read in great books, St. Augustine and Dante Alighieri. Those Christian classics, Confessions, Commedia, to which I refer in the book. For all three writers, Eros and Agape find a hidden wholeness in the practice of caritas. And the epigraph to the novel reads like this. It's from John 12, 24. Except a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Jesus spoke these words as he entered Jerusalem into his passion, death, and resurrection. The words which comp comprise the novel's epigraph suggest its recurring theme. The epigraph presents a seminal image of finitude and fruition. It suggests that self-giving love in response to God's love is the human person's deepest desire. To reiterate, a both-and vision must include the reality of a decisive either-or. See, I've set before you life and death, good and evil. That's from Deuteronomy 30. Moses presents here a stark either or and its similarity and in, in its similarly high stakes choice between life and death. The novel is both and and either or. I mean, if you think about it, a both and imagination has to include either or 
because it can't exclude it by the logic of both ends. It has to be inclusive. And I want to give you a concrete example. Um, paradoxically and aptly, the cross becomes the tree of life in the novel, the roots of which lie hidden in other worlds. The cross stands as the novel's symbol for that which brings forth much fruit. Its counter image is the gallows. And on Friday, our, our students will be talking about Yvonne and his decision. Whether I go to court and confess culpability, what do I do? The man with whom I've been speaking has killed himself. He's chosen the gallows. And he promises Alyosha tomorrow the cross, but not the gallows. And this either or is decisive. But even the tiniest of charitable deeds can redirect and realign a person to the form of Christ. In the novel, this might be the gift of a kiss, a pillow, a pound of nuts, a pound of nuts that open an orphan child's eyes to the hidden ground of Trinitarian love. The gratuitously offered little onion can be salvific. These are beautiful moments in the novel. I'm gonna use the last five minutes to share my screen and talk about the theme of the icon and one particular icon, an icon of Christ that I hope elucidates a little bit more this both and vision. And this will take us to a quarter to five. And I'm going to ask Jeffrey to call me as soon as I'm finished at my office number. And then uh, between Jeffrey and the chat, I'll be able to take questions. So let me share screen now. Sound, yes. Uh, I won't be showing any videos, but I'll optimize. And there's my screen. And there's my PowerPoint. And there's our friend, Fyodor Dostoevsky. It's the most famous portrait um, that we have of him. And um, the icon that I want to show you, though, is, is uh, here. This, uh, I don't know if, let me just cross that out. Um, this is an icon that was actually painted in the sixth century. That means it was painted about a hundred years after the Council of Chalcedon formulated that Christology, which understands Christ as fully human, fully divine, without separation or confusion. I think another both and can be seen in this oft reproduced icon. The original has never left Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is the place where St. Catherine's Monastery and Orthodox Monastery is, and some of the most beautiful and oldest icons are there. And in the Orthodox tradition, and increasingly in other traditions, um, the icon is becoming more and more important. But in this icon, I think we see, I hope you do, a kind of asymmetry. When you look at the eye of Jesus to your right, how does he seem to be looking at you? When you look at the eye of Jesus that's to your left, how does he seem to be looking at you? Most viewers say the right eye seems harsher, a little more judgmental, calling us to task, perhaps calling us to self-examination. Where did we go wrong? To what extent are we responsible for the ills of our world or the suffering of people even closest to us? So Zosimus says, we are each responsible to all and for all. And this becomes his mantra. It's repeated by other characters. And it sounds like a ridiculously profound burden. How can we be responsible for everything that goes wrong? What we see in the novel is that actions have kind of ripples of consequence. Good seeds are sown, bad seeds are sown by characters. But that expression for all appears elsewhere in the novel. When Alyosha listens to Yvonne talking about the torture of children, hideous stories of, of children suffering. You can see them on the news any night. Um, Look at the images of violence, of, of, of children suffering by starvation. And Yvonne says, I, I can't accept a world 
that's built upon the suffering of children or any future harmony is built upon that. And Alyosha says, you're forgetting the foundation is that one who died for all, whose redemption is offered to all. For all is an expression that is used in the Orthodox divine liturgy, um, the Eucharistic prayer. And um, when you think about these two for alls, you have a paradox. We're responsible for all. Christ, through his redemptive grace, lives and redeems for all. We have work, we have grace. Grace is the foundation and the work of active love begins. And somehow for me, this icon has a kind of heuristic meaning when you think of the way in which the incarnational both and imagination, whoever this artist was, obviously a anonymous artist of the sixth century, brings together both judgment and mercy, both the hand of blessing the hand of utter openness and acceptance, and yet the call to be responsible to all and in our everyday ordinary lives. Um, I'm going to say just now a couple of words um, to conclude, and I hope some of you have, have some questions. Let me re stop the share and come back to you. Um, I think Elizabeth Perang is in this call and she's one of the librarians to whom I'm so grateful. And about a week ago, she sent me an email um, saying, have you seen this article in First Things magazine? You know, when we're all going back into the library as protocols allow, you can find this on the magazine rack over by Starbucks. And it's an article written by Gary Saul Morrison. It's entitled The Greatest Christian Novel. What do you think he's writing about? Three guesses. The Brothers Karamazov. Um, it's a good book. It's a, it's, it, it's, a good, it's a great book. It's a good article. Um, and I think he makes a good case, but so have many others. Malcolm Muggeridge, for example, once said, if you want to give somebody some sense of what the Christian life is, could you do much better than giving them the Brothers Karamazov? Um, some of you might know the actor Martin Sheen, who lives here in town. He was given that book by a director, Terrence Malick. He read it in a week it brought him back to faith. I mean, it just changed his life. He always attributes a kind of conversion experience to reading that book. Um, first things, okay, here's where I go with the, with, the, with the binaries and the both and. People who read magazines know, especially Christian magazines, this is a conservative magazine. Uh, I'm writing an article, it'll be similar to what Morrison is doing in this article for Commonweal magazine, which at least in Catholic, and I think Mark would say Episcopal, liberal Protestant readers would say, oh, that's liberal, liberal Protestant, liberal conservative. How often do we hear these binary terms in our conversations these days and find ourselves weary? Um, what I'd like to leave you with is, I think reading works of literature like the Brothers Karamazov, um, bring us to a place where we can transcend those binaries and begin to see each other as persons and our calling as persons um, to build bridges with each other um, and to find our commonalities. So on that hopeful note, I will now turn to Jeff, who will call me at 4894. Ah, good, thank goodness, my man Taylor writes, Taylor, I owe you one, buddy. There he is. Okay. Hello, Jeff. Now, this is comical. You see me on a phone here. Is this uh, Mission Control, Houston? Okay, so I'm going to put the phone down. And I'm just going to look at uh, the screen because Taylor has written a wonderful question. If I could hear you, I'd ask you to read it yourself. So I'm going to read Taylor's question. If there truly is a hidden world or an underlying, infinitely integrated presence of God in all things, could it not be possible for one to dedicate themselves to the world, including the people in it, and therefore also be de dedicating themselves to God and God's love, whether they know it or not? Amen. 
<laughs> I sure believe so, Taylor. Uh, does Dostoevsky, let, let me get there, is awareness of or dedication to this Christian reality a necessary feature of being capable of actively loving each other and minimizing suffering? I just want to answer that no. You've heard of Doctors Without Borders. You've heard of agnostic. You all have agnostic atheist friends who you say to yourselves, this person is so good. To use the term both and, can an individual be both an atheist, agnostic, hold an opposing religious belief, and dedicate themselves to the divine love of the Christian God? If so, then it seems that one can reject Christianity, yet also be inadvertently a disciple of act of love that Dostoevsky presents. I, that, that's as good a question as I could have ever, ever hoped for. And uh, I hope I don't get fired for answering it, but uh, I'm with you, Taylor. I, I can't hear you, I can't see you, but um, I'm in a faculty reading group and there's a wonderful man, Daniel Doherty, who teaches in Heidelberg and we've been in dialogue and he pointed out that Albert Camus, who loved this novel, so many people love Dostoevsky, everybody from Sigmund Freud, Wittgenstein, Einstein, everybody read this and has something to say about it, but Camus was powerfully moved by the figure of Yvonne, and I know that you are too. Um, it sounds so perhaps glib and cliche, but God works in mysterious ways. Grace works in mysterious ways. God can do whatever God wants. God works with whomever. And I think that's one of the messages that I get in in Christianity, one, I mean, in, 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 in Karamazov's vision of Christianity, that one can um, ask all the hard questions that, 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 that Yvonne asks, and yet still find oneself drawn to the reality of responsibility, the reality of actively loving the persons closest to you. I mean, we're gonna, I don't want to steal the thunder from Friday's conversation, but to me, the fact that Yvonne shows up in court to testify on behalf of his brother is huge. I mean, maybe it's an onion. Nobody understands him. It's, it's, it's a broken confession, but it's, it's, it's a very, very important step. Um, now, whether where, where Camus was at the end of his life, Daniel and I were, were, were corresponding about this and... Uh, you know, people wonder, you know, what happened with Camus, but there have always been um, those who have struggled with faith um, or rejected institutional religion for a variety of reasons. I mean, Dostoevsky doesn't shy away from showing some of the worst aspects of institutional religion in the novel. Um, there's another monk whose a counterpoint is Asima Farapont, who's a kind of egotistical ascetic. I mean, he distorts the the, the discipline, the, dis, the spiritual discipline of um, asceticism as a way of um, willfully projecting his own ego, or what Nietzsche would call will to power. Um, so, no, you know what what what, what Zosima says to Yvonne is um, the very soul that you have that God's given you. Of course, for Zosima, it's a gift, um, but that soul that's betwixt belief and disbelief and not able to rest in either is itself a gift because there's something there's something large about that. Um, and when Yvonne hears that affirmation of his path, he gets up and receives Zosima's blessing. Um, even though he'll say to Alyosha later that day, I don't believe in God. So I don't know if this answers your question. What's, I really, I don't know, I know you're making a movie and maybe you won't be in class on Friday. I invited you to the eight o'clock class if you can make it. But if you could be there Friday, I'd love for you to be there. I think your question is crucial and, and that you do not have to be a believer to be powerfully moved and changed by this novel. I, one last anecdote. I was at a uh, Dostoevsky conference with colleagues, and um, for some reason, I think I may have brought it up, belief came up. One after the other said, no, I'm an atheist, I'm an agnostic, I'm an atheist. But yet these are people that are powerfully moved again and again by reading and teaching this book. So, you know, 
Grace is everywhere. And our propositional declarations of faith do nothing, I think, to keep God and God's love from operating. I mean, that's the ground. So Taylor, thank you. And if, maybe if you can just tell me if I answered your question, if you have a follow-up, just put it in the chat. I'm learning how to be a better chatter. I usually, usually I'm not. Jay's Lynn, I'm gonna answer your question. I promised I would if you showed up. What should Dimitri do, Siberia or America? Big, big decision Dimitri faces. Should he escape? Should he take his punishment? Jay's Lynn, I've got a 10 page defense in my book of Dimitri going to America. And uh, I'll share that with you if you want, but I, I don't want to do too many spoilers for the rest of the audience. Here's Jack. I think Jack has a question here. The Brothers Karamazov doesn't oh, have a very satisfying or even a complete ending. <laughs> Who says it's great? Alyosha, despite his efforts, doesn't very obviously bring forth much fruit. Read again. What do you think we are to make of this ending in light of the epigraph? Except a corner we fall into the ground and die. Thank you, Jack. Brilliant question. Um, I love what uh, another writer wrote. I was reading a manuscript recently. If the last line, in some translation, it's not actually the way it is in the Russian, but I'm not a Russian speaker, but the experts tell me often in English it ends hurrah for Karamazov. Well, what does that mean? Karamazov is a name that suggests a kind of black smear of sensuality, violence. It also means anointed, as I've learned from one of my colleagues. And at the end of the novel, Alyosha, who has a profound effect, I think, if you read closely, small seeds, small onions, but a profound effect, especially on the young people who could have become Bolsheviks 20 years later. And the Bolsheviks attempt to destroy God in Russia. Now I'm coming out strong, Taylor, against uh, atheistic communism here, but, um, you know, what's the legacy of that? This is what Morrison talks about um, and emphasizes in his work. Um, one life didn't matter. Many lives didn't matter. In the name of an idea, slaughter millions. That's totalitarianism. I'm going to get to your question, Jack. Just I'm on a tangent. I'm, I'm still thinking about Taylor. But here's the thing. It's open-ended because the novelist, Dostoevsky respects the freedom of the readers to imagine their endings. It's incumbent upon us to ask ourselves, what does it mean to say at the end, hurrah for Karamazov? We have to answer that question for ourselves. I do think that the speech at the stone recapitulates those last pages, so many themes in the novel. We'll talk about that next week in our class, but um, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm very glad he didn't write a sequel. Juliet, what are some of the examples of building bridges you find most powerful throughout the novel? Um, I'm not sure if the next one, I'm going to read the next one too. Dimitri in the book, in a state of confusion after conversations with Rakitin in the jail near the book's end, asserts that morals can't exist without God or without love of God. Um, is that true to Dostoevsky? Does that mean one can't truly have active love if they don't believe in God? This is Taylor's question again. Good. Or does that mean that active love can't exist if God doesn't exist? Um, from Dostoevsky's vantage point, and I think he is articulating this by giving voice to the Russian monk Zasima. Zasima says, uh, the one who does not believe in God will not believe in God's people. And I don't want to be glib about this, but one might again point to Lenin and Stalin, who, for them, millions of deaths didn't matter. Dostoevsky perhaps saw it coming. If the person has an inestimable, inestimable dignity, what's grounding our recognition of that dignity? Kant says it's because we're rational, we're free. In great books, we read Kant. But is Kant, like Nietzsche suggests, really living on the borrowed capital of Christian tradition? Where do we get this idea that a person is made in the image and likeness of God, or that a person has inestimable dignity by virtue of their personhood? I heard a talk earlier today, it's been a long day, um, by a woman who was here in 1969, when a 15-year-old guy 
carrying a basketball was shot outside the gym by a security guard. He was a black fellow. George Floyd is the more recent example than many others. I, and I don't know how exactly this would take form, but I'm going back to the point of how are we to build bridges. Um, I believe that talk of difference, identity and difference, and we can talk about this in class, be it racial, gender, um, sexual, socioeconomic, um, that the language of personhood and the vision of personhood that Dostoevsky offers in the novel gives us a way to build those bridges in conversation, in loving attention. And there's no way I would say that a person who doesn't propositionally say, I believe in God, is incapable of active love. It's just that I, from my Christian vantage point, would believe the act of love that I see in that person finally is grounded in the creator um, and the sustainer, the hidden ground of love. Um, but um, the conversation never ends and there's nobody who's excluded from that conversation in, in, in Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. Um, we can talk more about that maybe in class. Can you describe one way the Brothers Karamazov affected you in real life? Very good question, Scott. I don't know, ask my wife and kids. I know my wife will often, <laughs> in a trying moment, say, active love is a harsh and dreadful thing. And uh, I'll leave it you, for you to imagine what challenge I might be facing domestically at that point. One more question, if I may ask another, what is the value of, ah, yes, realism in this novel? Dostoevsky stands in contrast to other authors, Tolkien, Dante, that approach the portrayal of the good in more mythic, fantastic way. Why do you think realism is valuable in the Brothers K? On, uh, early in the novel, Alyosha is described as a realist. He's described as a believing realist whose realism is not, whose belief is not founded on miracle. The narrator says that Thomas didn't believe when he touched the wounds of the risen Christ, he believed in his secret heart. It was there already. He was already capable of seeing reality as it is, um, a gift. I mean, the sheer miracle of being, okay? Um, I mean, one could, one could begin there. That's where the philosophers begin. The wonder of being. We were talking about the hymn of Dimitri, I exist, I am, whatever you believe. That in itself is a source of wonder. I think that um, I used to love reading Tolkien. Uh, I love Dante. I think Dante is quite the realist, actually. I mean, he's imagining the afterlife, but um, he's talking about real people that he knew in his Florentine experience in the 1300s. Um, I think it's very important to live in a way that we are apprehending and responding to the real. Not to, um, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody, you know, the images that surround us on the screen, um, the noise we may hear on social media or wherever, all those dichotomies, all those binaries clashing, but rather to apprehend the real person and the real situation before us. Um, I still, Go back to that idea that phronesis is that capacity to see the real and act upon it. And I like realism. I like novelists who describe the way we live as we are, but yet with an attunement to the possibility that material empirical reality isn't all there is, that there's a spiritual reality. Contemporary novelists like Alice McDermott, Tobias Wolf do this for me. There are many others. One more question. Oh, look, there's Taylor. Sophia, what other classic books would you recommend to read after the Brothers Karamazov? Um, I just mentioned two authors. Uh, read uh, Alice McDermott's uh, Some, Someone or After This, and maybe read um, Tobias Wolf's Wonderful Short Stories. Okay, we'll hash it out later. Oh, good. He's going to come to the eight o'clock class. One more question. In the novel, Divine Love seems to be more of an alleviation 
for those who remain. Much of Karamazov presents how individuals process and overcome suffering through personal strife or the loss of loved ones. But how does, this is very important, divine life alleviate the suffering and deaths of those who die either peacefully or brutally, especially those who never get the chance to find peace and suffering, like Zas and his brother Markel. It doesn't seem like heaven or eternity with God can be solely what counteracts such suffering, and it isn't. Um, we're out of time, but I'll send, this is the hardest question of all. What sense do we make of suffering? What sense do we make of innocent suffering? It's a wonderful book by Charles Taylor called A Secular Age. It's about as long as the brothers Karamazov. Charles Taylor is maybe the greatest living philosopher. He's a Christian believer. And he's taken seriously in all conversations, academic and otherwise. He says in that book that we are living in a time of excarnation rather than incarnation. And he says we have to find a way of making sense of the incarnation which may offer us a way of understanding suffering as participatory in the divine life of God. St. Paul says in Colossians, I make up in my own suffering whatever may be lacking in the suffering of Christ. What does that mean? That's part, I think, what the novel is trying to get us to understand that suffering might be offered as a kind of prayerful gift on behalf of someone else. Think of Ilyusha at the end. We'll talk about him. But for now, I think we have to finish. I can hear Jeff and Mark, but give me a thumbs up if you too think we have to finish. Oh, there's Mark. People want to get home for dinner. I, oh, oh, you're going to win it. Oh, look. Oh, autographed. I better go over there and autograph the books. Okay. God bless you all. I enjoyed this. I wish I could hear you. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, good students. See you later. Bye, Mark. Send me your introductions. I can read it. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, Jeff. I'm going to get my speakers working. Take care. Bye-bye.